So, so Faisal, um, uh, we are live now on Facebook and recording has also started. So you may start. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, wa ala rasulihi, wa ala alihi, wa ashabihi, ajma'in. And Ramadan Mubarak to all of our participants and to um, our sister, uh, Dr. Selene Ibrahim and her family. And, you know, this auspicious occasion on the uh, first week of Ramadan, we continue our wonderful series of women in the Quran. We've learned so much from you, Sister Selene, and Jazakallah Khair for all of that. And uh, the series is continuing for this reason in Ramadan, you know, so they say that, you know, anytime that there's a majlis of ilm, there, there are angels around. And in this particular auspicious time, you can imagine how many angels, inshallah, will be around as we do this. I'd like to thank all the participants for supporting at this time as well. And, you know, may Allah accept all of your siyam and all of your qiyam at this time. And, you know, may Allah bless you all. And Rabbi Zidni Ilm, and may he increase us all in knowledge. So, Sister Celine, with that, uh, the floor is yours. And Jazakallah Khair again for the ongoing series. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It's a pleasure to be with you all again. May Allah put barakah in our time, inshallah. We ask praise and blessings upon the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his family, and all of the righteous throughout all of time. I'm going to jump in fairly quickly today because my hope is to get through a good deal of content, inshallah. So I wanted to remind us that we've been these last few weeks talking about the ethics of marriage and how different stories of, regarding marriage show up in, in the Quran. And we've been looking at what are the ideals. And then in the this past week, we looked at where are where has the marriage gone wrong on the, the side of the wife? And so we've looked at last week a little bit, these troubled wives, um, including the wife of the Egyptian viceroy, the wife of Nuh and Lut, and the wife of Abu Lahab, which we'll delve into a little bit more today. And then we've also seen in the very beginning of the series, a righteous wife, Hawet, who um, just makes a small mistake with her husband. And then to, we'll see tonight, two of the wives of the prophet who make a small mistake and whose mistake is, um, in, is recorded in the Quran. I wanted to point out one interesting thing that I didn't get to last week. We saw that the wife of the Egyptian viceroy was the one Quranic temptress. So out of all of these 19 plus uh, women figures in, in the Quran, we just have one in this role. Now keep in mind, she is the foster mother of Joseph. So we also saw in a past week, this uh, woman named Asia, who is the wife of Pharaoh, another aristocratic woman who adopts a child. But here we have a righteous e example of a female foster parent. So the, the Quran, I, I argue throughout my work is about justice and balance. And we see the balance here. The Quran gave us an example of a, a problematic foster mother. And the Quran also gives us an example of a um, righteous foster mother whose uh, words we saw you know, my Lord, build for me a house uh, near you in paradise because she's um, suffering from a domestic violence situation. So also note that they're both aristocratic women. So we have uh, an example here of um, a, an aristocratic woman who is pious, even though her husband is corrupt. So I pointed out as well that there's two treacherous women in the Quran and, and the, they are wives of prophets and yet they betray and the Quran uses, we'll see that word betray, they betray their, their husbands and uh, for that reason it was said unto them. So they, they have this passive dismissal, um, uh, enter, you know, enter the fire with those who, who enter. We'll also see tonight uh, the wife of Abu Lahab, who is uh, the only Meccan woman who is mentioned, who is also damned. So we have three examples in the Quran of women who are damned. So the context of the wife of Noah and the wife of Lut being, um, being damned is a, is a fascinating one. Both the, his, the historical context in that the the situation at the time of the prophet is that families are in fact dividing over whether or not they're going to follow monotheism and the path that the prophet is calling them to peace and blessings be upon him, 
or are they going to follow the, the um, old ways of, of the, the forefathers? And so in this context, if we think about the meaning of the, the particular mentions of, of the wife of Nuh and the wife of Lut, in this context, we see it's a, it's a direct example for the early Muslims who are making these decisions. Now it holds a particular significance because we see that this will be in a surah um, called Surah Tahrim, which is the 66th surah, which begins by addressing two of the prophet's wives who have made a small mistake. Uh, may God be pleased with them. They, they did repent from their mistake. But we'll see directly it, the wife of Nur and the wife of Lut are a counterexample of piety for the prophet's wives. And they're contrasted in the surah with Asya, who we just saw, this righteous foster woman, this righteous foster mother, this patient uh, wife of a dictator, and, um, and Maryam, who we've discussed at, at great length, the, the mother of Jesus. So the wives of the prophet, we'll see, are given these two uh, examples of piety and two examples of um, corruption. And I want to mention uh, seven times we have the wife of Lut mentioned uh, in, in the Quran, and sometimes just as an old woman who, who got left behind. And the biblical story uh, resonates very much with the Quranic story, although we don't have a whole lot of the details in, in the Quran. So what the Quran specifically says about these two women, they were under two of our righteous servants. So we can infer Noah and Lut, may God be pleased with them. And they, the wives, betrayed them. And uh, you know, they, Noah and Lot, availed them not against God, meaning that the, the prophets, even if they supplicate for, for their wives, the, the matter of our fate, may, may God help us, it's uh, up to you know, our own piety and our own righteousness. So it's a very stern, stark reminder. And I think I just want to pause here and say it's a good practice, inshallah, to pray for you know, our offspring, pray for our spouses, you know, pray, pray for those in our families. But we also have to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the caretaker of hearts and that if a heart turns away, there is no guidance but Allah's guidance. And, you know, and, and the same way, we, we never know who, um, who will be guided uh, in terms of being guided to, to the, um, the tawheed, the oneness of God. So here we have Surah Tahrim, which I've been mentioning. And... Um, this word, you might be familiar, those of you who um, might not know the meaning, this, this is coming from the same root as the word haram, which, uh, and also the harem, the, the harim, the private quarters in a residence house. And so Surah the tahrim has to do with the, the private affairs of the, the Prophet uh, Muhammad and his, his wives in, in his home. But we see here the surah starts with a direct address to, to the Prophet sallam, Why do you prohibit what Allah has made lawful for you, seeking the approval of your wives? And God is most forgiving and merciful. So here we have an example of the Quran uh, kind of encouraging the Prophet sallam, not to sacrifice. There's a whole backstory here. I won't get into all of it. It's a pretty juicy backstory though. Uh, but he essentially, in, in one of the interpretations of this, the, the story that we find in the tafsir, he uh, forbade himself from honey because two of his wives were jealous because he always ate honey at another uh, wife's house. And so he um, prohibited prohibited himself from, in one interpretation, eating the honey, and in another interpretation, visiting that um, uh, the, the, the woman in, in, um, entirely. Uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a, a difference of opinion in, in the, uh, the tafsir. Um, it is a fascinating story for those who want to dig into it a little bit further. The point of all of this is that the, the two wives were, um, and we'll, the Quran doesn't mention who they are. I'll, those of you who know the story might already know who they are, and uh, we'll talk about who they are in a second here. But what we need to, to realize about this is that in many places, the, the Quran corrects husbands with regard to, to the treatment of their wives. 
And here the, the Quran is correcting the wives and who the wives of the Prophet وسلم, and, and may Allah be pleased with the, with the wives. So we see that there is still this idea of balance. Um, two sessions ago when we were in person, we looked at how in different places husbands were being corrected. So here we see the disillusion of oaths. We saw this disillusion of oaths when of, on the about the oaths of zihar, which are when the husband says to a wife, you are like the backside of my mother. So again, the Quran is giving us you know, a, a situation that involves wrongdoing and oaths, but the gender roles are, are switched here. Um, so God is, is your protector, meaning the, the prophet here, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may peace and blessings be upon him. Um, and he is the knowing the wise. So here's the little bit of the backstory. When the prophet confided to one of his wives a statement, and when she informed another one of it, we still don't know who they who they are. Allah showed it to them to him, meaning Allah uh, gave the prophet the understanding of what the two wives had been talking about behind his back when he asked one of them to uh, to please not divulge uh, a piece of information. So Allah informs the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that that this wife did indeed uh, divulge a piece of information. So the prophet says to her essentially, um, in what, what have you said? And um, she, she said right away, who told you this? Uh, so essentially it's this very uh, human behavior when you know, all of us probably have maybe made a mistake and then uh, somebody calls us out on it. And we said, wait, 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 how did you know? How did you know about that? Uh, so it's a it's a humanizing moment for um, using the example of of one of the wives of the prophet. So I'm going to tell you in a second who their identities are. Uh, but what what the important thing to take away is that if we do make a mistake, then the best thing to do is just to come clean, to account for it right away. And uh, you notice the wife did not deny it or didn't it didn't turn into a greater controversy. Uh, her curiosity just came up, like, how did you know that? Uh, so mashallah, may, may we be people of truth. And when we do make a small mistake, maybe we, may we be really quick to, to make amends and, uh, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hearing and seeing no matter, uh, you know, what we do, whether it's, uh, with one other person, with two other people uh, by ourselves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, you hear, uh, the knowing and the acquainted. So these are two of the Asma Allah husna the beautiful names of, of Allah. Allah, um, Il Alim, um, and I believe it, this might be Al Khabir. I have to look back at the text. Uh, so uh, this is the voice of God. If you two wives repent to to God, it is best uh, for your hearts have deviated. But if you cooperate against Him, meaning against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then indeed God is His protector and Jibril, so Jibril, the angel of of revelation. And the righteous of the believers and the angels, uh, moreover, are, are his assistants. So it's a strong, very, very strong. Uh, and then in case that was not uh, strong enough for the consciousness of, of these two wives, um, he, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, perhaps his Lord, meaning the prophet, mean, prophet's Lord, meaning God, uh, if he divorced, uh, if he divorced you all, so if the prophet divorced all, all like you, you wives who are giving, you know, uh, making up conspiracies kind of and plotting and planning behind his back, uh, would substitute for him wives better than you, um, submitting, believing, devoutly obedient, repenting, worshiping, and um, this word here, traveling, some people translate it instead as fasting, which um, I think actually makes more sense for, for the context. That's the way I translate it when I write about it. Um, previously married and, um, and virgins. So these qualities here, all of these submitting, believing, devoutly obedient, repentant, worshiping, and in the other verse, fasting, which is why I think this is better understood as fasting. Uh, we've seen this in, in Quran 33, 35, that verse in the very beginning when I showed you and I several times since that establishes what are the 
characteristics and qualities of righteous people. We saw believing men and believing women, and it goes back and forth. So these qualities that have to do here in the surah uh, that God is saying, these are the qualities of a good wife. They're actually also the qualities of a good person in general and male or female, those are the qualities that, that God mentions about the good person in general. It, it also is notable because surah Surat Ahzab, which is number 33, which has that verse about the, the spiritual parity, it also, these two surahs, Surat Ahzab and Surat Tahrim, both talk about the household of the Prophet, both have a Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam address him and the believers, and they actually have a same rhythm that, that I point out when I do kind of a structural analysis. So there's a close connection to these surahs, and it's not, it's not lost to someone who's reading the Quran closely or listening to it repeatedly, that there is a, a, an exact parody in, in the wording. Okay, so let's, now that we've seen, this is the surah, by the way, that goes on to talk about the wives of Nuh and Lut. Notice it's mentioning two of them. So two of the prophet's wives, Noah and Lut. And then at the end, it mentions Asya um, and Maryam, may Allah be pleased with, with them. Uh, so here's, if you want to hear more about the stories of uh, the women around the messenger, this is my book recommendation. It's on the slide here by Muhammad Ali Qutub. And uh, it's just called Women Around the Messenger there. It's a very, very detailed account of not just the big names that people tend to know, but all of the wives that I've listed here on, on the slide. Remember the Prophet وسلم, was married to Khadija radiallahu anha, may God be pleased with her for 25 years. And they had a monogamous marriage. And then later on, uh, he, he, after Khadija had passed away, he uh, was encouraged by the, the, those close to him to get companionship because it was so very difficult for him to, to lose his companion of 25 years. And so he married an older widow, um, Sauda, right here, radiallahu anha, may God be pleased with her. And then the order that I've put them on here is the order that we find the marriages in the, in, in, um, in the bi biographical literature. You see down here, uh, Maril Qaptia, Qaptia meaning the Christian Coptic. So she actually came into the household. Some people identify her as a wife um, who would have slightly different rights than a concubine. Uh, but all of these other women here, some of them are Arab, some of them are, are Hebrews living in, in Arabia, some of them, including um, Maria Qatia, uh, come from the Christian community. And it's thought that the Prophet وسلم, was using marriages as a way to draw these different communities together, the Jewish community that was in Medina, the Christian community that was in Arabia. But in particular, who are these two wives in Surah Al-Tahrim? So Aisha bint Abi Bakr, who is obviously the daughter of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with, with all the righteous people in that family, and Hafsa uh, bint Omar. Uh, may God be pleased with Hafsa and, and, and Omar. Uh, so Omar uh, ibn al-Khattab is another caliph. So here are two, two daughters of two of the most righteous people in um, you know, in, in early Muslim history, the you know, two very, very close um, companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May God be, be um, uh, put peace and blessings upon him. So we see that these are also, um, Hafsa had been married before she was uh, slightly older, most likely in her twenties when, when um, or, or um, potentially, yeah, about, about that. So these are two, Compared to some of the other women who have come into the household, they're a little bit more of the younger ones, the more energetic ones. And the, the Quran kind of in, in very clear terms, we see essentially says like to, to these women, look, you have to make a choice. Are you, you know, going to be stirring controversy behind the prophet's back? Um, may peace and blessings be upon him. Or are you going to be these, um, these examples of righteous women? And so in that, in this context, when we see, when we see 
this word betrayed here used for the wives of Noah and Lut, we can understand, oh, it's referring to the actions of, of the, the two um, wives of the Prophet, so Allah who, um, you know, had this uh, minor betrayal of the Prophet, so Allah um, So I just wanted to remind us that the, these are righteous women, the, the Quran calls them the people of the house and talks about the language of purifying the people of the house. They are called in, in the Quran to a higher standard and they do have to make this choice. The Quran presents them with the choice on uh, of do you want to live up to these higher standards? And it instructs the prophet, you know, if if your your wives, um, you know, don't want to be married to you anymore, then then you know, just divorce them and in, in, in good, um, you know, in in good standing and provide you know provide their um, a means for them as as they as it is according to to Islamic law and divorce a woman's entitled to to certain rights. Uh, so we we see that they are held to this higher standard and the, the Quran puts that for all of us to, to understand. Now, what do I take away from this as kind of an ordinary person is that um, when it comes to the matters of the family, we have to be so, so careful to keep one another's trust because trust is one of the most uh, precious things that in a marriage that a couple can have between each other. So inshallah, may we be um, trustworthy people. May our spouses be trustworthy for, for us. Those of us who are looking for marriage, uh, trustworthiness is you know, one of the qualities that is, is very beautiful in, in a person if, if you can find it. Uh, may Allah make us people of, of, of um, you know, truthfulness in speech and um, may we perfect that this Ramadan, inshallah. So we've seen pious women. Now we're going to go back and, and see uh, Aura bint Harb, who is better known as uh, the wife of Abu Lahab. Uh, her real name, uh, we see her real name, bint, as those of you who know Hebrew on the call might um, guess, means daughter. So Aura, the daughter of Harb. And here is her uh, Konya, which is a nickname. And you see Om, Om, sorry, Om. Uh, we've seen that mother in, in a previous lecture and um, Jamil, which in, in Arabic means beautiful. Although we see here that her character is far from be beautiful. She is a, an aristocratic woman as well. So all of the other stories about aristocratic women and especially you know gossiping aristocratic women should have maybe triggered a, a bell in her head you know some some moral guidance there for her but unfortunately she is uh, one of the meanings of you see here she's called carrier of firewood is potentially a person who stokes up you know rumors and gossip who kind of feeds the flames of of social discord it's also the, this is a um, very witty language in, in the Quran because now I, I should say, as I'm introducing her, I should say that Abu Lahab, her husband, is actually an uncle of, of the Prophet Muhammad and he is the, um, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he is the only close uh, uncle of the Prophet Muhammad who does not uh, protect him and indeed who uh, insults him openly, who um, taunts him. And one of the taunts that that he uh, uh, offered towards the prophet at a at a very prominent moment when when all of the leaders of the Bani Hashim were gathered, the Bani Hashim meaning, being the, the specific tribe of, of the prophet um, Muhammad in 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 within the larger umbrella of the, the Quraysh tribe. Those of you who know like Native Americans, it's the same kind of structure where you have maybe like the Iroquois and then under the Iroquois, you have different branches. Um, so uh, the, you know, Abu Lahab is a very close relative and he is living right in immediate proximity to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his wife is tormenting the Prophet and uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and throwing garbage and all kinds of um, horrible things. And so the, the Quran um, responds to this occasion where Abu Lahab cursed the Prophet, like cursed him like by his two hands. And so the, the Quran uh, responds. So we've seen, I want to point up just 
we've seen there's a lot of verses about mercy and God's mercy and compassion, but we also see that that God is quick to take into account those who do wrong. And so whether it's a you know kind of a tiny wrong in the household of the prophet Muhammad, you know the verses are. Let's look look at them again just to reinforce how very strong they are. Yeah. You know, if giving this opportunity, you know, repent, that's better for you. And here's your other option, uh, which, which, you know, everyone is um, turning against you here. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we learn from looking at these two, two surahs that uh, Allah is great in mercy, but there is a line where people cross it and, uh, may Allah make us of the people who are righteous, and when we do make mistakes, we correct it. The the image here about the the neck of the wife of Abu Lahab is an it, it's thought to be the fact that she had a very ornate necklace. She again, she's aristocratic. She's very proud of her her status. So she's a good reminder for us um, not to be vain, as as both she and her husband are reputed to have been. Uh, and this this necklace she once swore on it uh, and cursed the Prophet Muhammad, you know, on on this um, uh, ostentatious necklace that she was wearing. So there's, there's speculation that this reference to the palm fire fi uh, fiber around her neck, which would have been what you would light a fire with. So those of you who are Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, like, you know, you like get the little like, um, you know, fine thready uh, wood to start off the fire. So that's the palm, the palm fiber there. So um, the surah is, uh, even um, lahab in Arabic means flame and Abu, you can use this in Arabic to mean like the father of something, meaning like uh, the one who possesses the thing, the one who exhibits the thing. We have a famous uh, hadith, trend, um, hadith uh, commentator, hadith transmitter, sorry, who is named Abu Huraira, Huraira meaning like kittens, because he used to foster the kittens and make sure that they had um, food you know he just a kitten lover can sympathize with that but um, Abu Lahab here like father of the flame so the Quran is even playing on um, his nickname here that he was apparently very very proud of saying uh, Abu Lahab meaning the flames of of hellfire so there's a there's a um, a lot of irony in these these short surah and of course it has a rhyme and an assonance and a consonance that's that makes it very memorable one other thing about the surah that is uh, fascinating is that in the revelatory order of the quran so as the quran is is being taught by the prophet muhammad as he's receiving it in in muslim understanding from the angel jibril uh, may peace and blessings be on jibril gabriel the fatiha comes in the revelatory order, the Fatiha being the prayer that Muslims say regularly, that praises God, that asks for guidance, and that, uh, that says, you know, God make us not among the, the wrongdoers and those who have gone astray, that these, this Fatiha comes in the revelatory order right after, according to some commentators, there's, there is some difference on, on when the Fatiha uh, comes and is, is first uh, taught. But if you think about the words of the Fatiha that have to do with praise to God and guidance, you can see it's a stark example. This, this particular surah is a stark example of what happens when you fail in life by putting things like wealth and social status above humility and um, you know, kindness and generosity. And... and um, yeah, may Allah make us of the people who are righteous. So this Surat al-Masad, as it's also known, you'll hear it, Surat al-Lahab and Surat al-Masad, is way in the back of the, the Quran. So it's one of those surahs that even children learn very early because a lot of times children start memorizing the Quran actually in the back because those are the shorter segments that are um, a bit more easy to, to remember. So she is the wife of Abu Lahab, 
when we're looking at the revelatory order of the Quran, she is the very first woman mentioned. So even before Eve, we're thinking, if we're thinking about sacred history, Eve's the first woman, but she's not the first woman mentioned in this kind of revelatory order of the Quran. So the first woman that is discussed in the revelatory order of the Quran as best as we can discern it and understand it from all the different methods that scholars use to understand the revelatory order is this wife of Abu, of Abu Lahab. So she stands as a very stark reminder. Not only do we come back to her, learn her, her story first as children potentially, but she stands as this um, negative example. Don't be ostentatious. Uh, you know, don't, don't be cruel. Um, you know, don't spur on discord, gossip, et cetera. So may we uh, take heed of those lessons, especially um, in, in Ramadan, where we're not only watching what we put into our body, where we're watching as well what, what comes out of our, our, our body. May Allah make us those of pure speech. So that finishes up the problematic wives. I realize I'm at 8.30. I'm just going to go a little bit more today because I wanted to get into what today's topic was, which is this idea of social reform. I've showed you in the past many places where the Quran has social reforms that have to do with women's well-being. So things like don't force women into prostitution and you know, wives have financial rights and um, husbands have these financial obligations towards wives and don't kill your female children and you know, the importance of education for, for all people and, 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 and it goes on and on. But what I want to look at more closely here in the about five minutes that I'm going to take, is the idea that by presenting certain examples of female um, political agency, the, the Quran is presenting a, a, a kind of a quiet kind of social reform. Now, we've seen the Queen of Sheba before. Now, I wanted to, whoops, let's see here. I wanted to tell you a little something about the story. I'm going to do it very quickly uh, and not as thoroughly as I'd like to, but it's in, see if you can follow me as I do it quickly. So the hoopoe, which is this bird that Suleiman has, um, he, Suleiman, um, peace and blessings be upon him, is a, um, you know, from the biblical stories as well, um, mighty king, a righteous king based in Jerusalem who's built the temple that still stands to this day. And he has this bird who does, as hoopoos actually in real life do, you see one there, uh, scouts. So hoopoos uh, tend to scout for water and things. This hoopoo um, is out scouting and uh, finds a woman ruling over this people who, as the hoopoo says, has this magnificent throne. And it's a little bit of a test to Suleiman in the way it's presented in the Mus'haf because you know, Suleiman is not tempted to compare like kind of a worldly throne. He's thinking of the throne of, of God in the verse. So Suleiman, it shows that he's really thinking about, um, about his subserviency to the divine king, the divine ruler. Um, so we saw in a previous class how when... Suleiman sends this letter to, to Bilqis, the queen of Sheba, how she engages in diplomacy. We're going to see that in a minute here. And then ultimately she submits with Suleiman to God, the Lord of the worlds. Now, we have to underscore here how successful the queen of Sheba is. The hoopoo has pointed out that it is a woman that is ruling over this people, um, commentators, suspect that this is actually in southern uh, Yemen, where she's ruling in the kingdom of Seba, or Sheba, as we call it in English. So she said, oh, imminent ones, advise me in my affair. She's received a letter from Suleiman saying, come to me in submission. And she calls the letter noble. She reads it out. It says, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, come to me in submission. So she takes this letter to her council and says, you know, advise me, I wouldn't decide a matter until you um, uh, witness. And the word here is the same one we use for like the shahada, the, the, the shahid, um, to, to testify or to, to bear witness to a thing. So the shahada in Arabic, there's no God but God, and Muhammad is a messenger of God. So here's the, she's calling her 
her advisees to say, look at this letter, what do you think? And so what do they say? Uh, they say, you know, we are, here's the, you know, we possess, nahnu ul kuwa. So um, uh, kuwa meaning strength and, um, you know, we have this great military might. And, but, you know, the, the matter is yours. Uh, so see what, what you'll command. So they're pushing her towards war, essentially. They're mentioning their strength and their military might. And she goes the diplomatic route. So just, you know, very brief touching on that story that the Quran is elevating not only a, a female political ruler here, but one who chooses diplomacy over warfare, even when those around her are pushing her to, to war. Um, then she, when she does... Um, Kind of submit to God with Suleiman. She says this beautiful prayer that I have, you know, wronged myself. And uh, here's the verse that I showed you before. And I submit with Suleiman to the Lord of the worlds. You'll remember I showed you at the offset that this Rabbi inni zalemtu nafsi, like my Lord, truly I have wronged myself is also what Moses says in the very next surah when he accidentally kills a man and then repents to God for having killed a man. So she is, as this woman sovereign who has chosen diplomacy, who has guided her people in, in um, the righteous path, speaks in the, the same um, kind of idiom as do not just Moses, but in another place, um, Yuna, Yunus um, alayhi salam, Jonah. Uh, so she is an example of, of political um, acumen. And next week, when I start doing our recap, inshallah, I'll show you how she is not the only woman in the Quran who's politically savvy. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God the most great, gives us a story of a young girl who is also quite politically savvy. We've seen her before. I promised you I'd talk about her again. And um, inshallah, I'll do that next week. So let me pause here and see. Oops. Let's see if we have um, questions, inshallah. And I'm putting this on the screen in case there's, uh, let's see the podcast, yeah. So up here you see podcast episodes. So you can find them at this green link on, on the bottom in case people are interested in, in more resources. A lot of times I do videos and then upload them to, to that site. So um, let's pause there for questions and answers, inshallah. Inshallah on the answers. I hope you have questions too. Thanks, Celine. That, again, a wonderful talk. Um, you're covering a lot of material. Um, quick question. In, a, this, in the first part of the talk, you talked about you know, this, this mixture of, um, of varying characters of the women mentioned in the Quran, including actually the Prophet's wives. Um, you know, when we normally think about the companions and the, you know, the people at that time, you know, some of the stories are, you know, discussed with such um, vigor and almost in a supernatural level. I always feel like the, the Quran really emphasizes that these were really human beings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were equally prone to, to living the, the life of uh, regular humans. They made mistakes and, you know, they had to be, put in place or reprimanded or guided you know back uh any comments about that absolutely if we read through the quran even though in theological terms we have language that the prophets can't make mistakes in their theology we have stories about like take dunas who i just mentioned i mean he he god gives him a prophetic mission jonah and he runs away from it and so we do have even in the prophets who are sent as theological guides and as moral exemplar exemplars even they make mistakes but they're moral and fazl rahman for those of you who have read his works he he writes about this really poignantly that part of the way they are moral exemplars is that when they do make mistakes, even Adam, you know, made this mistake with, with Hawa, they repent right away. And so they're exem exemplars to, to us. And I mean, if I think about, I've been talking about marriage and things. So, oh my gosh, how many times do we make mistakes in a marriage, even from like, you know, your spouse asks you to do something and you totally forget, or, you know, you just, there's so many ways. And 
So we're, inshallah, as Muslims, we're, we're people of forbearance and we're people who are quick to, you know, take account, take ourselves into account, to, to make amends, to make things right. And, you know, we have to be gentle with each other. The, the hadith, there's the, you know, the beautiful hadith about making 70,000 excuses for, you know, for, for your fellow, um, you know, human being, let's say your fellow Muslim. Um, so I think, I think we, we can't lose sight of this, even as we look to the, the righteous, uh, you know, as moral exemplars, we, we can also look towards their errors as, as ways to, you know, to help ourselves navigate when we do make, make mistakes. Um, so sometimes people have, I'll say, as a, as a chaplain, I've seen sometimes if people make a mistake, they have, uh, they get down on themselves very hard. And if we have to discipline our ego, we can, we can, you know, be hard on ourselves, but we can't, there's like everything else, there's a balance. We can't be so um, hard on ourselves about our mistakes that we um, lose sight of all of the mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showers us with in any you know, any moment. And these are the, the nights of Ramadan that are particularly about mercy and where, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower us with that mercy. So when we do make mistakes, let's, you know, hold ourselves quickly accountable, make amends if we've hurt somebody in, in the world, who we, that we can rectify the situation, we rectify the situation, we vow that we won't do that thing again, even if it's really hard for us. And even if we fall short, we just uh, confirm our resolve again, inshallah. And and we're human, and Allah made us that way for for a reason, for a purpose. So, uh, yeah, may Allah guide us, inshallah, and and be um, gentle with us and pour upon us mercy, inshallah. I also want to add that all your talks in this series are going to be on the ICB Wayland YouTube channel, live. I'm recorded. I mean, recorded. Uh, so I, I guess I'll pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, you know, corrects any mistakes that I have made in this series or, or made tonight. And, you know, may all of you who are just breaking your fasts and starting your tarawih, the, the evening prayers, uh, may Allah you know, make, uh, you know, give you strength to to fast and and um, pray and, and accept all of your striving. And um, for those of you who continue to join us for, from the interfaith audience, thank you so much. It really, really means a lot to us to feel, you know, your your solidarity and, and your your camaraderie um, in in our sacred learning. So Jazakumullah khairan and thank you, ICB Wayland. Um, you're amazing. May Allah bless you. Well, God bless everybody, and we'll see you guys next week, same time, the last session. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah.